This is Duke University. And welcome to Duke Law School's 49th Annual Dean's Cup Final Round, organized by the Moot Court Board and hosted by Dean David Levy. At this time, we ask that you please put away any laptops. I know, yes, you, Grayson. <laughs> and silence your cell phones. Thank you. Uh, the Moot Court Board is a student organization focused on mock appellate advocacy. The board hosts intramural competitions here at the law school and also competes against other law schools in tournaments across the country. This year, the board has been very fortunate to have the support of many hardworking individuals in preparing the Dean's Cup tournament. Dory Main, the um, board's intramural coordinator, has logged countless hours managing this complex tournament. In addition, our Dean's Cup coordinators, Brian Leach, L. Gilly, and Alex Bluebond, have gone far above and beyond in their preparation and planning. This tournament would not have been possible without them. The board also thanks Professor Sean Andrew Sear for preparing this year's problem, along with his teaching assistants, James Harlow and Chris Berg, for their efforts in helping prepare the judges' bench brief. Furthermore, the board thanks the faculty and alumni who judged the tournament competitors in the rounds leading up to the final. Lastly, we thank Dean Levy for his support of the board's many endeavors. We have been especially grateful for his support of this tournament in particular since his arrival here at Duke Law School. And now I'll give it over to Jory to give you some background information on the tournament. The Dean's Cup competition was founded in 1963 by Deans E.R. Laddie and J.D. Johnston. It is Duke's premier oral advocacy competition and is held annually for second and third year students. This tournament began with several preliminary rounds in which students competed individually. The 16 competitors with the highest oral advocacy scores were invited to participate in the round robin semifinals. Semifinalists also submitted a full length brief. Faculty members graded the briefs and selected a winning brief for each side. We would like to recognize Sarah Boyce and Chris Ford, who had the best brief for the petitioner, and Chris Jones and Lee Choker, who had the best brief for the respondent. The highest rated teams from the semifinals advanced to the final round today, and the winners of today's round will be presented with the Dean's Cup. The Dean's Cup also provides an opportunity for competitors to qualify for membership to the Moot Court Board. And we would like to welcome our newest members, Phil Obart, Tom Gallagher, John Cosgriff, Eric Mattingly, Lee Choker, Tori Simmons, and Haley Warden. And now I'd like to welcome Brian Leach, who will introduce the judges. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Leach, and on behalf of Duke Law, I'm delighted to introduce the three esteemed jurists who will be judging this year's final round. Uh, with us today from parts far and near uh, are Judge O'Scanlan of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Uh, Judge Lee Rosenthal of the Southern District of Texas, and Judge James A. Wynn of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in uh, Raleigh. First, uh, Judge O'Scanlan was appointed to the Ninth Circuit in 1986, following a distinguished career as a lawyer both in government as well as in private practice. He received his undergraduate degree from St. John's University, a law degree from Harvard Law School, and an LLM from the University of Virginia. From 1969 to 1974, Judge O'Scanlan, uh, he held a number of positions in the Oregon State Government, including Deputy State Attorney General and Public Utility Commissioner. Judge O'Scanlan also served as a government lawyer and consultant in the federal government, most notably as, uh, as on the advisory panel for the United States Secretary of Energy from 1983 to 1985. In addition to his service as a public lawyer and judge, Judge O'Scanlan also served in the United States Army Reserve JAG Corps from 19, 1955 to 1978. Next, Judge Rosenthal was appointed to the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas in 1992. She received both her undergraduate degree and law degree from the University of Chicago. Following graduation from law school, she clerked for Chief Judge John Brown of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. From 1978 to 1992, she practiced law at the prestigious law firm of Baker Botts in Houston, where she was named a partner in 1985. In 1986, Chief Justice William Rehnquist appointed uh, Judge Rosenthal to the Judicial Conference Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure, 
which among other things supervises the rulemaking process for the federal courts. In 2003 and again in 2007, Judge Rosenthal was named chairperson of that committee. In acknowledgement of her achievements as chairperson of that committee, she was, she was awarded the uh, prestigious 2007 Reform in Law Award for Legal Achievement issued by the Library of Congress. Finally, Judge James A. Wynn was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit in 2010. Judge Wynn earned his uh, bachelor's degree from uh, North University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, his law degree from Marquette University School of Law, and an LLM from the University of Virginia. As a lawyer, Judge Wynn practiced law privately in his home state of North Carolina and served as a judge advocate general in the United States Navy. In 1990, Judge Wynn was elected to the North Carolina Court of Appeals, where he won re-election in 1992, 2000, and 2008. In addition, he served as an Associate Justice of the State Supreme Court of North Carolina in 1998. A member of the American Law Institute, Judge Wynn was the 2002 Marquette University School of Law E. Harold Hallows Distinguished Lecturer. In 2007, Judge Wynn chaired the Judicial, Di Judicial Division of the American Bar Association, during which time he helped to draft the ABA Judicial, Co uh, Judicial Division Code of Judicial Conduct. Additionally, Judge, uh, Judge Wynn has chaired both the Appellate Judges Conference and the 2009 ABA Diversity Summit. Please welcome me in joining these judges. And welcome, please join me in welcoming these judges to Duke Law. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Al Gilly, and it's my pleasure to introduce the competitors for this evening's competition. Uh, representing the petitioners, we have Sarah Boyce and Chris Ford. Sarah Boyce is a 3L from Belmont, North Carolina. She graduated from Davidson College, majoring in English. And after graduating from Davidson, she was a core member with Teach for America in Washington, DC. Notably at Duke Law, she is editor-in-chief of the Duke Law Journal. Uh, last summer, she worked for Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher's Appellate Litigation Group in Washington, DC. And after graduation, she will be clerking for Judge Sutton on the Cir Sixth Circuit. Uh, moving on to Christopher Ford. Chris Ford is a 3L from Westfield, North or sorry, New Jersey. He's been a member of the Moot Court Board since 2009 when he won that uh, intramural Jessup Cup tournament. Uh, he serves as an articles editor for Duke Law Journal and plans to work for Debevoise and Plimpton in New York upon uh, graduation. For the respondents, we have Phil Aubert and Oscar Schein. Phil Aubert is a 2L raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He graduated from Dartmouth in 2010 with an ROTC commission in the U.S. Army as a second lieutenant. He previously served as an enlisted soldier in the Army. And at Duke, Phil is the president of the Federalist Society and a member of the Public Interest Law Foundation Board. This summer, he will be interning at, uh, in an Army JAG Corps office. And finally, Oscar Schein. He is also a 2L. He grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and received a BA in political science from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, before law school, he worked for Google in both India and Singapore. And at Duke, he is a staff editor also for the Duke Law Journal. This summer, he will be working for Sullivan and Cromwell in both the New York and Hong Kong offices. And now, Alex Lubon will introduce the summary of the problem. Hi, everyone. I'm going to introduce the problem, so hopefully you can follow the arguments a little bit better than you could otherwise. There's also some information in the program that you can take a look at as their competitors are arguing. In 2006, Cardinal William Lovada of the Catholic Church issued a directive to Catholic social service organizations to stop placing children up for adoption in same-sex households. The, uh, excuse me, in same-sex households. He based this, resol or this directive off the Catholic belief that, sa that marriage is between a man and a woman. Uh, in response to that directive, the Board of Supervisors for the City and County of San Francisco passed a non-binding resolution that called the Catholic position ignorant, hateful, discriminatory, and unacceptable to the citizenry of San Francisco. It also urged the Cardinal to withdraw this directive and the local organizations to defy it. In response to that resolution, plaintiffs in this case, Valerie Meehan, Robert Sunshine, and the Catholic League for Civil and Religious Rights filed a complaint in federal court alleging that the resolution violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Uh, the, the district court dismissed this claim on a 12B6 motion and then the plaintiffs appealed to the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit panel affirmed that decision before the Ninth Circuit issue, granted a hear, rehearing on Bonk. Uh, and that hearing, rehearing on Bonk, the Ninth Circuit uh, raised the issue of standing in addition to the, uh, the merits decision. Uh, they held that the plaintiffs had standing to challenge the resolution, but that, they did not, that the resolution was not a violation of the Establishment Clause. 
This competition presupposes that the Supreme Court uh, granted cert for that, on, that issue, on both those issues, the standing and the merits issue, and the competitors will argue both. And now, uh, again, reminder to silence your cell phones, and we're going to start the arguments. Please be seated. The first case on the agenda of the Supreme Court tonight is Catholic League for Religious Liberties versus the City and County of San Francisco. Counsel for the petitioner, are you prepared? Yes. You may proceed. <clears throat> Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Christopher Ford, and along with my co-counsel, Ms. Sarah Boyce, I represent the petitioners in this matter, the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Liberties. The Establishment Clause assures all Americans that their government will never officially condemn their religious beliefs, and forbids an official purpose to disapprove of a particular religion. When a government crosses that line, it, the stigmatic injury that it causes gives standing to those whose beliefs were officially condemned to challenge that discriminatory government conduct. The plaintiffs here have demonstrated a stigmatic injury caused by San Francisco's anti-Catholic resolution that will be redressed by declaratory and injunctive relief that this resolution is unconstitutional and barring future display or publication of the resolution's text. You maintain this standing exists no matter where the plaintiffs might live? No, Your Honor. The standing here exists because all of the plaintiffs and uh, sufficient members of the Catholic League as an organization live in San Francisco. They are residents of the city, and they are practicing devout Catholics. And so their injury derives from the fact that San Francisco has explicitly excluded them from their own community on the basis of their religious beliefs. So it's not the injury, it's the location that's important. Both are important. The location determines who can properly claim the injury on the basis of exclusion. A Protestant in New York would surely not have standing, as they're not part of the political community nor the religious community in question. The only place, as I can tell from the record, that this resolution was ever published was on the web, right? Uh, as far as the record makes clear, yes. So why does this person, why does the plaintiff have to be in San Francisco to have standing if the, the, there's no physical display, there's no uh, pamphlet, there's no booklet, there's no publication in that sense? A person from New York can see this as easily as a person from San Francisco. A person in New York could easily see it, Justice Rosenthal, but the harm they would have, the, the person in New York, even a Catholic in New York, would be nothing more than an abstract disagreement with San Francisco's policy. The Catholics who live in San Francisco were told that their religious beliefs are absolutely unacceptable to their fellow citizens. This is a far greater injury, and it is the kind of stigmatic injury that this court has repeatedly stated in cases outside the Establishment Clause context and sub silentio inside the Establishment Clause context provide an injury sufficient to confer standing. Well, counsel, I'm looking at the resolution in question, and it certainly targets Archbishop Niederauer, and it also uh, targets the Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese Organization. But I don't see anything there that applies to Catholics in general. What, what, what is your uh, particularity here? While the resolution does not name with particularity any of these plaintiffs, Mr. Chief Justice, it does forthrightly attack the religious beliefs that they hold. Because the Catholic Church requires individuals to accept the religious teachings promulgated by their superiors in the church, such as a cardinal or an archbishop, individual lay Catholics in the city and county are required to hold the same beliefs and the same religious positions as the cardinal. They're, I'm sorry. But the only action that's urged in this non-binding resolution 
is that one individual defy the directive and that another individual withdraw the directive. So how is uh, there the kind of act of uh, requirement that of defiance or disavowal of belief that um, your statement seems to imply? What occurred in, in the course of, of passing this resolution was effectively that San Francisco made it its official policy to condemn the position of the Catholic Church with respect to same-sex abortion. They did this by urging a cardinal of the Catholic Church to withdraw a particular directive, urging an action in compliance with that same policy. But by careful examination of the text of the resolution, it is clear that San Francisco was concerned with the content of the policy and not merely the content of what, Mr., uh, what Cardinal Levada was urging or, or requiring his archbishop to do. What do you call the text of the resolution? Is that the bold letter part that says resolution, or is that all this other whereas stuff? Uh, I'm sorry, M Justice Wynn. The entire text of the resolution uh, it suffices. It calls... The, the Catholic policy hateful, callous, discriminatory. It says that these views are absolutely unacceptable to the citizenry of San Francisco. By doing so, the San Francisco is characterizing resident Catholics as effectively second-class citizens, people whose views are unacceptable to their political community, despite the fact that those views are guaranteed by the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. In so doing, San Francisco effectively did exactly what this, this court said they could not do in Church of the Lakumi Bablu I. They had an official purpose to disapprove of a particular religion. In Lakumi Bablu I, this court characterized the prohibition on such an act as at the core of this court's Establishment Clause jurisprudence. But you've got to admit, San Francisco is not interested in challenging the Catholic Church. What they're interested in is the particular policy that's been set forth, and there's a historical basis for them wanting to ensure that perhaps children uh, could be adopted by same-sex parents. This is, there's a culture of it. Isn't that what really their focus is? And they're not, it didn't matter if it was Catholic, could have been Buddhist, could have been any other group. That's not the interest at all. Religion is really the policy concerns, isn't it? With respect, Justice Wynn, San Francisco cannot immunize an attack on religion by having made the same attack to secular groups. The Establishment Clause protects specifically religious organizations and allows re and affords religious beliefs a higher degree of protection. There is no parallel to the Establishment Clause for other actors like the mayor of Moscow, to whom a previous resolution was targeted. And San Francisco cannot hide behind those resolutions and claim that they allow it to take any action with respect to a religious organization's religious beliefs. There was an allegation in the complaint, as I recall, that there was a threat to withdraw funding from Catholic charities yes, if it did not agree to continue placing children for adoption in same-sex couples, with same-sex couples. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, assuming for the moment that that <clears throat> allegation is one that's entitled to be presumed true, what is the relevance of that to the, ex to the standing arguments and that are before us right now? There's no relevance. Uh, the only injury that would derive from that specific part of the complaint would be to the Catholic charity as who are not before the court. However, I'm sorry. Is there same uh, area? There's also evidence uh, in the record, evidence that we're allowed to take judicial notice of because it was in these various contracts that we are, uh, that were referred to in the complaint and attached. Um, there were um, parts of the contract with Catholic Charities that already place it under an obligation not to discriminate in the services they provide on the basis of sexual orientation. What's the relevance of that to this analysis? Any? Uh, with respect, Your Honor, the, whether or not those, uh, that part of the uh, contract actually applies to Catholic Charities is in some doubt as the contracts apply to social service organizations, and it's unclear whether Catholic charities would be so categorized. But again, that's more of a question as to the merits. It does not impact the standing uh, inquiry because Catholic charities are not before the court. The issue before the court is whether individual Catholics who have been called, who have been told that their religious beliefs are absolutely unacceptable to their peers within the community of San Francisco have standing to challenge this official policy of their government. In previous cases, this court has almost always assumed standing sub silentio and establishment clause cases. But where it happens. Even if we do find there's injury, 
What do you want us to do about it? This is a non-binding resolution. Doesn't mean much of anything. Doesn't have any, any action, as Judge Rosenthal indicated, that is required here. So what do you want us to do about it? Uh, the, the request we would uh, require, uh, I'm sorry, the, the relief we would request, Justice Wynn, is a, a, de a declaratory judgment that this resolution is unconstitutional and an injunction ordering San Francisco to take it down off their website and not publish it any further. Similarly, I'm sorry. How does that redress the harm? I mean, if, here's my point. Is there any doubt in your mind that even if those steps were taken, the official policy of the San Francisco City Council is going to remain the same. Yes, Justice Rosenthal, entirely because it will no longer be the official policy of San Francisco. And there is a world of difference between what individual commissioners may believe in private and what they are permitted to use the full force of the state to encourage. In, in Lee versus Weitzman. What full force of the state? It's a non-binding resolution. With respect, Your Honor, in Lee versus Weissman, this court found an inappropriate amount of state coercion on the basis of guidelines given to a rabbi by a middle school principal. If that suffices to, to incur, incur the state's displeasure, as this court put it, from a middle school principal, then surely the board of San Francisco suffices to in, in create a, a coercive effect that will resonate throughout San Francisco. You haven't talked to a middle school principal recently. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. It, it has been any number of years. My mother is a high school math teacher, and I can tell you she is, she is particularly forceful. Counsel, <laughs> counsel, before I was appointed to this uh, court, <clears throat> I used to be a member of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. An august, <laughs> an august body on which, which heard this case and uh, decided it by six to five uh, on the standing issue. So you have the uh, benefit of, of that in terms of, of what the Ninth Circuit did. But my colleague, my former colleague, Judge Graber, points out in her dissent that these plaintiffs, your clients, are really more akin to concerned bystanders. Isn't, isn't that really what we have here? Uh, I, I don't think you, you've, you've really z zeroed in on the um, individual impact, the action of the city uh, creates sufficient to give standing. Certainly, Mr. Chief Justice. And I think the, the issue you're alluding to was that raised by this court in Valley Forge Christian College. Yes. So turning, turning to that issue, and as it's addressed uh, by this court, both in Valley Forge and in previous cases involving stigmatic injury, uh, like Allen versus Wright and Heckler versus Matthews, this court has allowed cases to proceed on the basis of stigmatic injury, so long as there is more than this tenuous connection that would make an individual, as, as you put it, a concerned bystander. Now, a concerned bystander would likely be someone like the Protestant in New York, or even a Catholic in New York or a Protestant in San Francisco, someone who doesn't meet the nexus of being both a resident of the city that is condemning the religious beliefs and an individual who possesses the religious beliefs being condemned. The force of having both of those be true, similar to in prior cases involving sexism, where the propriety of standing, like in Heckler versus Matthews, originated because there was a discrimination on the basis of that class, that is more when it comes to a stigmatic harm than merely being a concerned bystander. That is being someone whose official government has said, your beliefs are absolutely unacceptable to your fellow citizens. What provision of the resolution says that? I'm sorry, one of the whereas clause, they're not numbered. One of the provisions of the whereas clause labels the beliefs inside, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Cardinal Levada's document as absolutely unacceptable to the citizenry of San Francisco. But the resolution portion simply urges Cardinal Levada to withdraw his discriminatory and defamatory directive. Uh, certainly, Mr. Chief is Justice. Is that enough? Is that, is that what you're relying on, that passage? That, that, that's enough to uh, create standing? Uh, I'm sorry, my time has expired, if I may You conclude. may answer the question. Certainly calling a belief discriminatory and defamatory is equally a condemnatory language that would create the same kind of stigmatic exclusionary injury and would suffice to provide these individuals standing. But we would urge this court to take a look at the resolution as a whole for reasons that Ms. Boyce will uh, elaborate on further in the Establishment Clause section. Thank you. Thank you, counsel.
Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Sarah Boyce, counsel for the petitioners. This case is about the misuse of government instruments to demean and attack the Catholic Church and one of the core tenets of that religious faith. The First Amendment prohibits governments from conveying a message that either approves or disapproves of religion. Under this court's well-established jurisprudence, the court looks to the three-pronged test articulated in Lemon v. Kurtzman to assess the constitutionality of a given government action. In this case, the government's action in passing this resolution violates all three prongs of the Lemon Test. As such, the resolution is an unconstitutional violation of the Establishment Clause, and the Ninth Circuit's decision should be reversed. Do you need all three prongs? No, Your Honor. We only need one of the prongs of the Lemon Test. And fortunately for us, this is one of them. absolutely, absolutely. Fortunately for us, any of the prongs will suffice in proving a constitutional violation. What's the strongest one you get? <laughs> the strongest one we have, Your Honor, is the effect prong, which says that irrespective of the government's professed purpose, what a reasonable observer would think is, what, is what's relevant in terms of the inquiry. And here, looking at the amalgamation of both the vitriolic language that San Francisco has chosen to employ, the preamble, which explicitly states that the purpose of this resolution is a religious one, and the resolve language and the, the weight and bulk of all of the provisions, it's clear that a reasonable observer would interpret this resolution as a message that disapproves of the, the Catholic faith, regardless of whether there is also a secondary purpose that relates to gay rights and the promotion of same-sex adoption. Well, since the resolution wasn't adopted until after there was this directive issued to Catholic charities that targeted the placement of children for adoption in same -se with same-sex couples, even though this policy on the part of the Catholic Church had pre-existed that for a long time. And since the, uh, the, not only the stated purpose, but the only action, if, to the extent there is any action at all in this resolution, is simply towards the um, directive that is focused on same-sex couple adoption, isn't there a very strong argument that the effect here is to promote the adoption of children with families regardless of their sexual orientation? Your Honor, with all due respect, there are two problems with that argument. The first is that while San Francisco has attempted to characterize this resolution as merely a response to the directive, the, the resolution itself incorporates language from the considerations document that the church had promulgated in years prior. Thus, the, the suggestion that this is simply a re in response to the directive seems to be a false, ac or a false statement. Well, since the church based the directive on the considerations document, uh, isn't it uh, logical that the, uh, that the response to it would also be based on that document? Doesn't that, I mean, why would that make the effect a religious one as opposed to a, res a secular response to a religious position that had a secular impact? Yes, Your Honor. The, the core problem here is not that San Francisco cannot specifically respond to this religious directive. And in fact, we do not suggest that they were not responding to the re religious directive. The problem is that the Establishment Clause erects a clear or, or set, sets forth a clear boundary as to how a government can respond in such a situation. The Establishment Clause does not preclude government from taking a position on religious matters, nor does it prevent, preclude a government from considering religious policies. It does, however, preclude the government from communicating its message or its official position in a certain manner. And that manner has been, has been looked at through the lens of the lemon, the lemon test and those three prongs. In particular, as the, the effect prong that I was speaking of looks to what a reasonable observer would think. Counsel, why are we talking about the lemon test? As I recall, uh, by now at least six members of the Supreme Court have criticized the lemon test as being ineffectual and inappropriate in dealing with these establishment <laughs> clause issues. And in fact, one member of the Supreme Court who's still sitting says that it's like some ghoul in a late night horror movie that <laughs> repeatedly sits up in his grave and shuffles abroad after being repeatedly killed and buried. <laughs> Lemon stalks our Establishment Clause jurisprudence once again, frightening little children and school attorneys. Why, isn't it time for us to adopt a new test in this area? <laughs> Your Honor, Justice Scalia's wit notwithstanding, the court, has yet to, the court has yet to overturn the Lemon Test. However, were this court to choose to depart from the Lemon Test, that would not 
constitutionalize what the government here has done. So the what court, would we go to? Instead of the lemon test, how do we uh, approach this issue? The court has looked to several different factors, though it has never outlined an actual test uh, through which to assess government action. Those factors range from the neutrality prong that mirrors or is an analogy taken from the free exercise clause jurisprudence of this court. The court has also looked to indirect well, coerciveness. This is not a free exercise case. No, Your Honor, this is not a free exercise case. However, in numerous cases, the Supreme Court has looked at, looked at the extent to which the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause are two sides of the same Why coin. Why is it not a free exercise case? Your Honor, it, there is an argument that perhaps the free exercise, that this could have been brought as a free exercise case. However, the Ninth Circuit had clearly established that it could not be brought as a free exercise case. They did that on bunk? No, no, Your Honor, it was actually done in a different case that noted that it could not be a free exercise claim in light of the non-binding nature of the resolution. However, the Establishment Clause uh, argument was available, and thus that explains in this particular case why it was not a free exercise claim. Even under the lemon test, as ghoulish as it may be, <laughs> yes, Your, Honor. your argument that effect is the strongest um, case for violation that we have, the effect here is nothing. There's no uh, binding e effect as by its own terms. There's no consequence for ignoring it. There's no teeth. It is nothing but words on a website. That's it. Your Honor, with all due respect, the court has not characterized effect in exactly the way that you're characterizing it. The, the court has looked toward effect as simply whether or not the government has appeared to take a position with respect to a religious matter or whether the government has appeared to approve or disapprove of a religion. It does not re require that the government have taken a position in a manner that is binding on all citizens. It does not require that it have taken a position in a binding statute. But it's it has simply to have some consequence. Not necessarily, Your Honor. For example, as my co-counsel discussed in uh, his part portion of the argument, the court in Lee versus Weissman struck down the use of a simple pamphlet that prescribed recommended, um, or it set forth recommended requirements for prayers that would be put forward during a high school graduation. In that case, it did not matter that that, that, that document had no binding effect. It simply stated a, a position that approved or disapproved a particular religion in the same way that this non-binding resolution establishes an official policy of the church, whether or not it has consequence going forward. Well, you've got an objective component to this. What reasonable person would think that knowing San Francisco and knowing the area would think their aim is the Catholic Church or your religion, when in fact what it appears as though they are aiming toward is the, this particular policy? Your Honor, it does appear that, that the resolution is aiming at this specific religious directive. However, that's precisely the problem. The problem here is that unlike in the other resolutions that San Francisco has passed... Well, I understand it from a subjective perspective, but I'm thinking what reasonable person would do this? Your Honor, with all due respect, any reasonable person looking at a, re at a resolution that has merely one entirely secular provision and that in its um, preamble, which expressly states the purpose of the resolution and states that it has a religious purpose, would interpret that, not subjectively, but objectively, to be a religious message or to at least communicate a position on a religious matter. It's, it's not merely the vitriol, it's not merely the preamble, it's not merely the resolve language, it's the amalgamation of all of those things that would lead any reasonable observer, whether or not he knew the history of San Francisco, to conclude that this resolution has the primary effect of addressing and disapproving of the Catholic Church, regardless of, of San Francisco's longstanding issue with re respect to gay rights. Well, I gotta admit, this does sound a little bit more persuasive than your argument on purpose and, and entanglement. Uh, would, would be in the brief. You, you agree to that, don't you? I do agree that, in fact... more persuasive. That's not that persuasive. <laughs> 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 yes, Your Honor. I do, I do admit that secular purpose is not our strongest prong in light of the um, deference that, is, that this court has chosen to show towards governments. However, I would argue that both the uh, primary effect prong and the entanglement prong are strong, and I would not concede that our, our petitioners lose on the prong that relates to secular purpose. Where is the entanglement? Your Honor, with the respect to your clients. Yes, Your Honor. The entanglement relates to both the insertion of the government into the internal governments of the Catholic Church and the threat that Your Honor mentioned earlier that related to the withdrawing funding from Catholic charities. Both of those, in light of this court's recent 
uh, Hosanna Tabor decision suggests that that would constitute excessive entanglement. While that case did not deal with the Establishment Clause, it did deal with the wall between church and state and emphasized and reiterated the need for the court to fortify that wall and to ensure that governments stayed out of any matter that related to ministers or internal governance of a church. But as I understand, it was on a table that was aimed primarily at ministers. In other words, the government cannot interfere with the church's selection of its own ministers. Uh, isn't it quite of a stretch to get from there to this resolution? No, Your Honor, I don't believe it is. In this case, in effect, what San Francisco is saying is that Cardinal Levada is, in fact, it explicitly says an unqualified representative, but that his views, his statements, his explanations of Catholic doctrine are not welcome and are not acceptable. In well, so in doing... In this one area, excuse me for interrupting, but just in this one area. Yes, absolutely. But in so doing, the San Francisco is effectively communicating a message that Cardinal Levada is an unqualified minister in exactly the same way that the court in Hosanna Tabor addressed whether or not government could get involved in ecclesiastical decisions of that kind. Yeah, but that's that sort of rhetoric. Uh, is there anything the government is doing to prevent him from his ministerial duties? No, Your Honor. I mean, in fact, Cardinal Levada is in the Vatican. San Francisco has no power to control him. The problem here is that the nature of the Catholic Church in terms of its top-down hierarchy necessarily means that San Francisco is also urging these Catholics, petitioners, to defy their religious beliefs. Catholicism is differentiated and distinct from for the Protestant faith in that independent reasoning, independent um, interpretation of doctrine is not encouraged. The shepherd cannot be separated from the flock in the same way in the Catholic religion that it can perhaps be in other religions. And thus, in urging both Archbishop uh, Niederauer to defy the Cardinal's directive and in urging Cardinal Lovata to withdraw his directive, the government is injecting themselves into this internal governance and interfering with individual Catholics' beliefs in a way that is plainly unconstitutional in violation of the third prong of the Lemon Test. Did that have to be an intended result for unconstitutionality to be found? No, Your Honor. The government's intent is only uh, relevant in terms of the secular purpose prong. It is not relevant in terms of the third prong or the primary effect prong. Yeah, assuming that to be true, the word rhetoric appears frequently in your brief as the way in which you characterize this resolution. If all it is is rhetoric, where is the entanglement where is the impermissible effect? With all due respect, Your Honor, the government only can speak through rhetoric in most instances. Oh, and they here. They can speak through criminal penalties. <laughs> they can speak through enforcement of something that actually has teeth. It goes back to the same issue. If something is merely a statement of position with respect to the secular effects of a religious position, even if it's accompanied by. Uh, rhetoric, is that an unconstitutional crossing of the line? Yes, Your Honor. And had San Francisco chosen to pass this in a statute, that would certainly have been more problematic. Or had the state of California passed this in a statute, that would be an even clearer unconstitutional violation. However, the fact that this is non-binding does not immunize the statement of official policy from the constitutional inquiry. One last question on that. What if this resolution had said, instead of uh, the words unacceptable, unqualified representative, um, hateful, and the um, rhetoric. What if it had had the resolution part intact, okay? Urging defiance of a policy that uh, the city found inconsistent with its commitment to equal opportunities for uh, same-sex couples to adopt. Your Honor, while that would have been a harder case because the compilation of all the factors would have been f f closer to the line that the Establishment Clause draws, that would still be a violation as it would still fail the third prong of the Lemon Test and excessively entangle government in the internal governance of a religious organization. In e even if it's non-binding there? Yes, Your Honor. And again, the court would look to what the, the reasonable observer would think and would have to carefully scrutinize the various provisions and the preamble and the context in which the resolution was passed. But it's not simply the rhetoric and the vitriol that is a problem here. It's the weight of all of those factors combined. In Abington v. Shimp, this court clearly said, it is no defense to urge that the practices here may be relatively minor encroachments on the First Amendment. 
The breach of neutrality that is today a trickling stream may all too soon become a raging torrent. I see that my time has expired. May I briefly conclude? Yes, you may, counsel. This resolution is that trickling stream, and if allowed to, to stand, portends the raging torrent that this framers attempted to forestall. As such, the resolution is unconstitutional, and the Ninth Circuit's decision should be reversed. Thank, Thank you, you. counsel. We'll hear now from the respondents. You may proceed, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Oscar Schein, counsel for the respondents, the city and county of San Francisco. I will be addressing the standing question in the case, and my colleague, Phil Aubert, will be addressing the merits of the Establishment Clause claim. As Judge Graber said very economically in her dissent from the Ninth Circuit decision on standing, standing focuses on the plaintiff, not on the issue. For jurisdictional purposes, the question is not whether the plaintiffs have raised an interesting question about the limits of the Establishment Clause, but whether they, as individuals, have a sufficiently direct and personal relationship with the resolution so as to give them standing. They do not, for two reasons. First, the plaintiffs are unable to demonstrate a direct and personal relationship to the government's conduct, and therefore are unable to meet the injury and fact requirement of standing. And second, even if they were, the injury is not redressable by any action of this court. Consequently, plaintiffs lack standing, and this court should reverse the Ninth Circuit with respect to jurisdiction and dismiss the case for lack of standing. Is it not reasonable for the individual plaintiffs um, or the League to um, perceive this resolution and the accompanying rhetoric as a direct attack on the personal religious beliefs of the members of the League? Justice Rosenthal, the intensity of the litigants' interest in the outcome has never been enough to create standing. The court recognized that in Valley Forge. The question is not whether plaintiffs are feel intensely about what the government does, but whether the government has done something direct and personal with respect to them. So I think that the fact that Catholics may justifiably even be upset by this resolution doesn't mean that as a class they have standing. They have to demonstrate something that goes beyond that. This court in Lujan called the injury in fact requirement part of the irreducible minimum of constitutional standing. There, plaintiffs are required to demonstrate an invasion of a legally protected interest that is concrete and particularized, which the court then glosses as being direct and personal with respect to the plaintiffs. Well, they're living right there in San Francisco, and this is being made right there in San Francisco, and there is this such this thing that your counsel on the other side speaks to in regard to spiritual stigmatic injury, why does that not exist here? Certainly, Justice Wynn, and I'll, I'll tackle that in order, specifically to start with the residency requirement. It is true that there is some authority for the idea that living in the place where the government action happens is a factor in standing. That was considered by the court in Valley Forge, and a court on the Fourth Circuit says that standing is more likely to lie when you're challenging action by your local government. But that still doesn't, that no court has adopted a per se rule that merely living in the relevant jurisdiction automatically gives you standing. In Suhra, the Fourth Circuit case I just mentioned, that was still resolved on the time and space relationship that plaintiffs have. Did you have. say it was a Fourth Circuit case? Yes, sir. That's a particularly persuasive person. <laughs> <laughs> we, we try. We try to pick these cases strategically, Your Honor. Uh, th that there was a display case in that case, and it was still ultimately resolved on the frequency and directness of the plaintiff's contact. So that might be persuasive to some degree, but there's no per se rule that residency alone is enough to establish standing. Moving to the second part of your question, the real essence of petitioner's argument here is the stigmatic claim. They open their argument with that. And the source of authority there is Allen v. Wright. But Allen v. Wright says very clearly that there's a difference between abstract stigmatic injury, where one sees government conduct that one disagrees with and believes that it stigmatizes them as a class, but has no direct relationship to what the government does. In that case, you still have to be personally subject to the stigmatizing behavior before you have standing as a plaintiff. And I think that's analogous to the rule this court drew in Valley Forge, where the mere psychological consequence of seeing the government do something that you disagree well, is not counsel, sufficient. Counsel, we, we found standing where somebody is attending a football game and doesn't like the prayer, uh, somebody walks by a crash scene in front of a county courthouse or a park, or there's a display of the Ten Commandments on the state grounds of a capital. Surely, if any of those convey standing, a direct, hateful, uh, vitriolic uh, resolution by the government of your own town ought to create standing. No? 
Th those cases are distinguishable, Your Honor, in the sense that there, there is a physical manifestation of the government's establishment of religion. So to take prayer at a football game, well, isn't it, you isn't are- Isn't like a virtual monument? I mean, the fact that your own city government has passed a resolution, the press covered it, it's all over the press, it remains on the website for everyone to see, isn't that enough? Uh, to be to be fair, Justice O'Skinlan, that is the rationale that the Ninth Circuit adopted on standing under a theory that they call the mind acquisition idea of standing, that once you become aware that the government is ostensibly hostile to your religion, you have standing as a member of that class. I think it's notable that the Ninth Circuit wasn't able to cite any authority for the adoption of a test like that. Well, it's only fairly recently, uh, in fairness to the Ninth Circuit, that we've had yeah. these kinds <laughs> of... Um, of uh, internet only disseminations. I mean, in, welcome to the modern age. I, th that's entirely fair, Your Honor. Although I think it's relevant here that, that nothing in the complaint suggests that these plaintiffs have accessed the resolution through the internet or otherwise. In fact, nothing in the complaint suggests they've even read it. The only complaint here is that they are aware of it. They have the mind acquisition that the government has acted. But is that crucial? You, you, they allege they are aware. Does it matter how they became aware, it, whether they they were sitting in the council chamber when they passed it, or they read the newspaper article, or they went to the website. Does that matter? That, they matter. that is the entire inquiry, Mr. Chief really? Justice. The, the relationship in time and space between the plaintiff and the government's conduct is how you sort plaintiffs who have an abstract stigmatic injury or Valley Forge's psychological consequence from those that have the kind of direct and personal relationship with government conduct that this court identified as the essential part of the injury in fact requirement. So, for example, for, so to go to your example of prayer at a football game, there you are exposed to a religious invocation, and it disrupts your enjoyment of the public function. Well, let me ask you a question about the difference between the cases in which the the establishment clause violation being alleged is that there was an endorsement of one religion, and you're not in that religion, you the plaintiff, uh, on the one hand, and the case that we have in front of us which is that your religious beliefs are specifically targeted as disfavored. There is, it seems to me that there ought to be a, little, a difference in analysis because one is targeted at me, which ought to make it easier for me to have standing as opposed to promoting you, which only indirectly disfavors me and a whole bunch of other people. So can't you make an easier case for standing here than you could when there is a prayer invoking a deity that doesn't happen to be my deity and maybe not the deity of other people in the room? Here, they're telling me that my deity is really pretty bad. In the first case, Your Honor, the resolution is not directed at all Catholics in San Francisco. It doesn't say each and every Catholic is unwelcome here. There's a very clear plaintiff under exactly that analysis. It might be car the cardinal. It might be the archbishop of San Francisco. It might be the charitable organization that the city is criticizing here. Those people, if even if we adopted a test that said there was something special about disapproval, would have a more particularized and direct claim than these plaintiffs here. But as a second issue... So what you're saying is then the failure in the last whereas clause to specifically say, let's say, all San Francisco Catholics, that's the difference. That makes this case. Well, I think that would be a harder case, Your Honor. If the, if the city of San Francisco said each and every Catholic is an unrepresentative citizen of the city of San Francisco, there might be a better yeah, argument this, there. Yeah. Yes. If, it, it is hard to imagine a more particularized relationship than when the government identifies you by name and when it takes some kind of action. So in this case, that at best would give a better standing argument to the cardinal, the archbishop, and maybe Catholic charities. But these plaintiffs are not named in the resolution. It doesn't specifically criticize them as individuals. So I think under, even under a disapproval standard as articulated by this court in the Church of Lukumi, the plaintiffs don't have a better argument here. But I think also for jurisdictional purposes, it's not obvious that disapproval really makes a lot of difference compared to endorsement, since endorsement is implicitly a disapproval of alternatives to some degree. In the Ninth Circuit case of Vasquez, the, the plaintiff there challenged the removal of a Christian symbol from the county seal and tried to use that as, as establishing standing through disapproval of the city. Well, why His, isn't this uh, the Lakumi uh, Babalu case? That was specifically targeted at Santeria, which is a specific religion. Yes. And the court um, threw that out. But the, Your Honor, there, there was a specific practice that was an issue that had to do with the Santeria. Well, the same practice here, your, your attitude on same-sex um, adoptions. 
the, the claim here, I should say again, Your Honor, is not that there is not a plaintiff somewhere out there that could challenge this resolution. The claim here is that these plaintiffs have not experienced the resolution and have nothing in the complaint to suggest that they've experienced the resolution in any sort of a direct but and personal way. But the resolution in Lukumi never mentioned the specific members of the Santeria religion. Or even Santeria. Or even Santeria, for that matter. It was targeting the, 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 the animal uh, uh, use. Right, and but I, I, I don't was that a non-binding resolution, Your Honor? I don't think that you had the same. The, the the essence of the argument here is that you're challenging a resolution that is in the first place non-binding, and the second place is directed at a party that's not before the court. But it tells people who have this belief, we, the City Council of San Francisco, as our official policy, holds your belief to be hateful. That's a pretty strong your, your Honor, position to take on a religious belief. It, it might be, Your Honor. And for juris jurisdictional purposes, we could concede that the resolution is unconstitutional. We're, we're not conceding that, I want to be clear. But we could. <laughs> well, that's the next for, one. <laughs> we, we could and still maintain that these plaintiffs as individuals do not have a sufficiently direct relationship. I think, Your Honor, to, in respect, I mean this respectfully, but I think the question inverts the standing inquiry. The order of operations here is not to identify a constitutional violation and then go in search of a plaintiff who might be able to challenge it. The order of operations is to start with the plaintiffs. In this case, whether you analogize this to a statute or policy or to a display or religious invocation, nothing in the complaint suggests that these plaintiffs as individuals have encountered the resolution. You know, from time to time, even though this court likes to follow its precedent, sometimes we may want to advance a particular legal theory uh, because the nature of the facts and the way the law has changed over time leads us to do so. For instance, in the, in the speech cases, when we're dealing with overbreath from a constitutional perspective, we've allowed individuals to come in and say on behalf of a third party who may not actually be there that they have a wrong against them, even though it does not touch that particular plaintiff uh, particularly. Why should we be right now, given the nature of the injury that's here, that's been alleged here, and given the, the position of these plaintiffs, because you're talking about their faith, even if it did not touch them directly, it's certainly touching the Cardinals, touching the Catholic League, why shouldn't we uh, move this law a little bit further down the line, even if it doesn't fit neatly within the parameters you've described. <laughs> I think, Justice Wynn, that the function of standing doctrine is to make better cases, to make cases justiciable. You want to sort those plaintiffs who have a merely ideological stake in the outcome of a case from those whose rights are actually at issue. Under the Ninth Circuit's mind acquisition theory, if this court chose to adopt it, you wouldn't need, you could hear third hand from someone that the government had taken some action that you in the abstract disagree with, but would then have challenge, have standing to challenge it just by the nature of your offense. That would upset all establishment clause standing jurisprudence from Valley Forge until today. In a display case, you wouldn't actually have to see under the Ninth Circuit's theory that a display had been erected. You would still have standing to challenge it. You wouldn't have to encounter a prayer at a football game, for example. The mere knowledge that it had happened would be enough. Are you saying that it would have been enough if there had been an allegation in the complaint that a sufficient number and I'm not sure what that number would be, of the members of the Catholic League who lived in San Francisco had accessed the website and read the resolution, that that would have been enough for standing. I, I think that, yes, Your Honor, I think that that would make a very different case. If they said that they got up every day in the morning. They read it once. Uh, I think if they said, Your Honor, that they got up in the morning, loaded the San Francisco website, and got very offended every morning, that would be sufficient to create standing in this case. I think that I would be Sure. I think that would be fine, too. Even if you know, I know it's there, I can avoid it easily. I don't have to access that website, or I don't have to open that part of it. There, there's is no, that enough? There's no avoidance requirement, Your Honor. Okay. The mere contact with the resolution is all that's required. And do all, does the complaint have to allege that all 6,000 members of the League have done so? No, I, Your Honor, I think they could get into court if they could, if they could uh, substantiate that one of their members had some sort of direct contact with the resolution. If, for example, someone had been at the meeting where it was adopted, I think that would be enough. If they printed it out and carried it around with them just for the purpose of getting very exercised about it, I think that would be enough. But this, plaint, this, this complaint, as it's written, is entirely deficient for standing purposes. There's nothing in the complaint that suggests that they've even read it, let alone encountered it with any kind of regularity. Well, they did quote it. Well, their lawyers quoted it, Your Honor. <laughs> I, th I think the, the, 
there, there are three possible answers to the standing question. Two of those are easy to dispose of quickly. There's the chill argument. They say that their access to government is chilled, but that's foreclosed by Laird v. Tatum. The subjective allegation that your access to government is chilled is not enough to create standing. There's the threat to withhold funding, as Judge Rosenthal asked about earlier, but that goes to Catholic charities, and they're not a party before this court. So the only plausible argument they have for standing is this idea of stigmatic injury, and that's been foreclosed by the court's jurisprudence in Allen v. Wright. It's not enough to merely feel that you are stigmatized you must be among those who are personally subject to the government's stigmatizing behavior. Here, the, nothing in this complaint suggests that plaintiffs have that sort of particularized relationship to give them standing. Someone might have standing, but it's not these plaintiffs. If we adopt the mind acquisition position of the Ninth Circuit, do we need an allegation in the complaint that says somebody in our 6,000 members at some point in their lives read this? If, if you adopt, time? I'm sorry, my time is expired. May I answer, may the, answer question? the question? If you adopt the Ninth Circuit's mind acquisition theory, then the complaint as it stands would be enough to get them past standing because they allege that they've become aware of the resolution, and that's all that would be required under that test. Thank you. Thank you very much, counsel. You may proceed, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I'm Phil Aubart, counsel for the respondents, the city and county of San Francisco. The merits of this case will determine whether a local government violates the Establishment Clause when it issues a non-binding resolution with a goal to condemn discrimination, defend the rights of its gay citizens, and protect the interests of the most vulnerable of its society, those of orphan children. We agree with plaintiffs that the Lemon Test lays out the proper constitutional framework here to analyze Resolution 16806. And here, the resolution is constitutional because it has a predominantly secular purpose, it has a primarily secular effect, and it does not excessively entangle itself with religion. Well, now on the purpose prong, how can you ignore all of the clearly anti-Catholic rhetoric that permeates five out of the six provisions? Well, Your Honor, when we look at the purpose, what we are looking for is to determine whether or not the government's stated purpose, which generally receives deference, is merely a sham or secondary to a religious purpose. Here, uh, while I, I dispute that this resolution itself is really targeted at being discriminatory towards religion, we have many arguments in the context of this resolution that support that San Francisco here had a legitimate uh, secular purpose. For instance, when looking at the purpose prong here, we want to look at it under the reasonable observer or the objective observer, as McCurry County told us. And that objective observer uh, cannot turn a blind eye to the history and context when looking at a challenge government act. Here, as I believe it was as Justice Rosenthal said, the Catholic Church issued its belief on, on homosexual adoption in 2003. San Francisco did not act at that time. Instead, it waited until 2006 when there was a directive issued to an entity that operates in San Francisco and which would make it harder for gay couples in San Francisco to adopt children versus straight couples in San Francisco. It waited until that point to act and issue this resolution. If San Francisco really had the purpose to discriminate against the Catholic Church or to disparage its beliefs, it would have done so in 2003. Doesn't the text of the resolution and the accompanying um, prefatory clauses give us some pause? I mean, there is, uh, facially, it is uh, anti-Catholic in its tone. It is disparaging in its tone. It uses epithets that are quite scornful and uh, quite dismissive. I, doesn't the text deserve some consideration in assessing the purpose? Your Honor, I, I think really the tone of the document really affects the effects prong, which is how the reasonable observer would see the message sent by this resolution. When looking at purpose, again, we are just checking to see that the government has a legitimate secular purpose that is not a sham and is not secondary. Um, for, for instance, in Van Orden, uh, this court considered a Ten Commandments monument. The text on the Ten Commandments monument is obviously religious, and yet this court found that the government did not have a predominantly religious purpose or, and, or, and indeed had a secular purpose in having that statute on the, 
uh, Texas state capitol grounds. Now, if you can look at the Ten Commandments and say, by posting that, a government doesn't necessarily have a religious purpose, how can you look at this resolution and come to the same conclusion? Um, this resolution here, while it does have, have comments to Cardinal Levada and urges uh, the defiance of a specific directive, which again operates in San Francisco, it also, in, in, the, in the title, says that this is about uh, the directive. It's not about Catholic belief. This is about the directive which forbids the place and placement of children in need of adoption with same-sex couples. Well, Council, regardless of the purpose, certainly the effect of this is to convey a message of uh, disapproval of uh, Catholic doctrine, does it not? Your Honor, this, this resolution does not speak to Catholic belief. Rather, again, it speaks to this specific directive. Well, the considerations is all about Catholic uh, doctrine and belief, is it not? Yes, Your Honor, but as the reasonable observer would, would view this document, looking through it, the strongest language is really reserved for this rhetoric. It's not about Catholic belief. Never does San Francisco say, uh, Cardinal Levada, you should change the Catholic Church's teachings on this. No, it says, withdraw your directive, which operates in well, San Francisco. The, aren't you quibbling? Isn't that the same thing? No, Your Honor, I, I do not believe it is. Here, San Francisco is concerned with the rights of its gay citizens, and the, the interests of its orphan children, as well as condemning a, a discriminatory act. Well, this last whereas clause says the board urges the archbishop and so forth to defy all discriminatory directives of Cardinal Levada, who's speaking for the church. Isn't, I mean, what, what, what could be more targeted than that? Yes, Your Honor. Again, though, I would characterize this as being defined discriminatory directives not define Catholic beliefs. San Francisco never suggests that citizens or anyone in San Francisco should not believe that it is harmful to children to place them with same-sex couples. But, but the whereas clause right above that, I knew you were about to say this, but <laughs> the whereas clause right just a few above that specifically takes issue with a statement of belief, in the, of Catholic belief, that is part of the considerations, a belief about whether it is uh, consistent with Catholic belief to allow children to be adopted by individuals in homosexual unions. It says it's absolute, it is doing violence to these children in accordance with Catholic belief. And the whereas clauses says that that is insulting, it is callous, it is a level of insensitivity and ignorance that the uh, Board of Supervisors of San Francisco, which apparently lives a pretty nice, rarefied life, if this is the worst <laughs> they've seen, um, <laughs> that they have not previously encountered or seldom seen. So I, it seems to me hard to argue that this does not focus on and take issue with Catholic belief. Your Honor, it certainly touches on an aspect of Catholic belief. However, the government is not forbidden from speaking on matters of secular concern that intersect with religious concern. And to what extent is the fact that they didn't do this in past resolutions? This is the one they, they named as Judge Rosen of the particular Catholic beliefs here are being spoken of more directly. Shouldn't we look to that? I mean, historically, in terms of how this is shaped out? Your Honor, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the history because, again, the reasonable observer cannot ignore the history and context of this government act. And while this is the only uh, resolution that addresses the Catholic Church, if we look at the other eight resolutions in, in, the, in the record, we see that in each instance, San Francisco, the, the, the city board of San Francisco, witnessed a discriminatory act, passed a resolution to condemn that act, and urged the actor to change that belief. This resolution is merely a continuation of that. Indeed, San Francisco condemned the 49ers. And when condemning the 49ers, they didn't say, 49ers, we hate you because you didn't go to the Super Bowl. They said, we condemn this training video, which is discriminatory. I guess you in San Francisco consider the 49ers a religion there. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, Your Honor, but not under establishment clause jurisprudence. By, by no reasonable observer would look at 
the, the condemnation of that training video and say, San Francisco is condemning the 49ers. In like this resolution, no reasonable observer would read it in light of San Francisco's long and established tradition of defending uh, gay rights and condemning discrimination and say, San Francisco really just has a bone to pick with the Catholic Church. No, it has a bone to pick with this particular directive which, con which contravenes San Francisco's stated secular policy on adoption. Indeed, uh, Bowen v. Kendrick told us that adoption itself was a legitimate secular issue, and merely because it's carried out by a religious organization does not transform that issue into a religious one. Counsel, even if, even if we accept that there is a secular dimension, the way in which this resolution is framed, the rhetoric that it uses is anti-Catholic. How do you get past that text in assessing the effect? Your Honor, we're looking at the text under the eyes of a reasonable observer, one who is thought to know the history and context of this resolution. So when this reasonable observer reads this particular resolution and the words in it for the first time, they already have the history and context that this particular resolution was passed in in their mind. They can't separate that part of their brain from the rest and merely read the text as if it was brand new. The world is not born again every day. And the reasonable observer must read this text, and you must read this text in light of the history and context. Well, if all we're talking about is the promotion of gay rights, why don't we just leave the resolution with the fifth whereas clause, whereas same-sex couples are just as qualified to be parents as are heterosexual couples? Why, why didn't the uh, resolution simply have that provision? Why did they reach out to try to uh, attack a religion? Your Honor, it's because this isn't just about gay rights. It is also about condemning discrimination against gays, which San Francisco has a long and established history. So they, need, they felt that they needed to speak loudly and clearly that such discrimination against gays in San Francisco is unacceptable. Well, why can't they say that without attacking the um, clergy of a particular religion or attacking a religion the way they do here? They certainly could, Your Honor. And if I had been their counsel while writing this, they would have. <laughs> However, the mere fact that they didn't doesn't, doesn't, uh, isn't dispositive. Indeed, the reasonable observer can only read the text and weigh it against the history and context or with the history and context. Would and you accept that one of the beliefs from the Catholic faith is discrimination against gays? I don't wish to proffer uh, uh, any, any sort of opinion on Catholic beliefs. But I believe that, Your Honor, at least in terms of what's here, it's San, Fran San Francisco would argue that the Catholic belief on, on homosexual marriage and whether or not gays can adopt children is discriminatory. So isn't that the effect here, is that you are seeking to express disapproval of that belief? A again, Your Honor, it's not disapproval of the belief. San Francisco doesn't want to disapprove of the Catholic belief but rather the effect that belief has in San Francisco. And the reasonable observer uh, would know San Francisco's long history. They would know that San Francisco did not speak when the Catholics promulgated this doctrine, but rather waited until it actually had an effect in San Francisco to take action. Their goal here was to protect their gay citizens, protect their orphans, and to condemn a discriminatory act in San Francisco. Well, counsel, your opposing counsel mentioned the principle of neutrality. Clearly, this violates the principle of neutrality, does it not? Your Honor, the Lemon Test was created with a mind to determining whether or not the principle of neutrality was violated. So it, it, it's a, a law is neutral as long as the reasonable observer sees it as not having a, a primarily religious effect. If, if the reasonable observer doesn't see it as being a religious issue. All right, separate out the, separate out the lemon test for just a moment. Just yes, take Honor. neutrality by itself. This, this clearly couldn't be neutral in terms of its approach. It, it clearly reaches out and, 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 and attacks a particular sect, does it not? Your Honor, the language is strong, and it, it does, as you say, address a specific sect. 
However, it does so in the context that it is responding to a directive which operates in San Francisco in an attempt to protect its citizens and defend its beliefs. And if San Francisco can speak on this issue at all, then San Francisco has the option to choose strong language if it so chooses. Indeed, the, the problem- So long as it doesn't violate the Establishment Clause and principles of neutrality, and then if you want to, some of the analysis of the Lemon Test, no? Yes, Your Honor. It needs to remain within the constitutional confines as laid out by the Establishment Clause. Is your side better off with the Lemon Test or without the Lemon Test? I believe our side would be better off without the Lemon Test. The Lemon Test has three individual prongs, each of which must be passed. I believe that we could look at this resolution while considering the context and history and see that San Francisco was intending here to stand up for its gay citizens, to, to condemn discrimination, and look out for the interests of its orphan children, and was not indeed attempting to attack the, the Catholic Church or, or show its disapproval of the Catholic Church, but rather, but rather one policy that operates within San Francisco. What's your best case? I think our best case is Van Orden, Your Honor, where the, the Ten Commandments, an obviously religious text, are on the state capitol grounds, and that is okay because of the history and context associated with that particular statue. Because uh, this resolution does not have a predominantly religious purpose, indeed it has a predominantly secular one, and because it has a primarily secular effect, and it does not constitute excessive entanglement between government and religion, this court should affirm the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and find no constitutional violation here. Thank, Thank you. you, counsel. The rebuttal will be, will be delivered now by the petitioner. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, once again, my name is Christopher Ford. I would like to make a, a factual point at the top of my rebuttal that goes directly to the standing inquiry as laid out by the respondents here. Paragraph 13 of the complaint, which is reproduced at page four of your joint appendix, states quite clearly that all of the individual plaintiffs here, one of whom is a member of the Catholic League, have come into direct contact with the resolution. This is not a case about any sort of mind theory of psychological harm. These individuals have come into direct contact with the resolution. They have been injured by the resolution. The resolution stands, as, your, your, as you yourself put it, Mr. Chief Justice, as a virtual monument to San Francisco's anti-Catholic position. And San Francisco is not saved by the fact that in the 21st century, its resolutions are online rather than typewritten. Rather here, at the very least, government must be prohibited from appearing to take a position on questions of religious beliefs as this court stated in Allegheny. The primary effect of this resolution is to oppose a religious teaching. And the best case that the respondents can cite for why it does not was a plurality opinion from Van Orden that has no binding effect on this court. So how did they come in contact with this resolution? The complaint- I, I see you say they've been injured, you have these conclusory statements, but is there anything in here that says they read it? The, the complaint says that Plaintiff Sonnenschein and Meeham have had direct contact with the resolution, which say, I assume... Did you say they read it? No, but I, I assume that direct contact does not mean that a paper airplane hit them. I assume <laughs> that it means that it read the, that they read it. Isn't that a conclusion, though? It's not a statement of fact. I think... I th had direct contact. I mean, shouldn't you tell me what it is? I think it would be a retreat to a, a pleading formalism that this court has repeatedly decried if we required the direct statement, we have read it, and that direct contact Wouldn't was insufficient. It would hard to say it, though, would it? It, it would not. It would not. And, and I would turn to my, my opposing counsel statement that as their counsel, I would have done better drafting. <laughs> but, and I see my time has expired, if I may briefly conclude. You may do so, counsel. Opposing counsel stated quite clearly that even direct contact, even one time, as Justice Rosenthal put it, would be enough to provide standing. These plaintiffs should have standing to challenge a clearly unconstitutional resolution, and the Ninth Circuit should be reversed. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. The case <clears throat> just argued will be submitted for decision. The court will adjourn and return in due course.
Please be seated. <clears throat> well, I must say that uh, the Duke Law School has given us an incredible challenge today. Um, this is by far one of the uh, finest arguments across the board I think all three of us have heard. And I guess it is my uh, duty to announce the winning team and the winning oralist, which I will do, but I think we will postpone that <laughs> just a little while <laughs> so that each of us can uh, make some, some comments, starting with uh, uh, Judge uh, Rosenblatt. Sorry. I, well, I get the Excuse great me. pleasure of being the first to tell you that you were all wonderful. This is my 20th year as a judge. I have seen a lot of lawyers argue in both district courts and on appellate courts. You guys did yourselves and your law school and those who have worked with you and trained you very proud. I mean, each of you really deserves to feel very good about your performance this evening, the briefs you wrote, the command you had of the case law, the facility you displayed in answering questions directly, even when you perhaps were thinking, what a dumb question. <laughs> you did not convey that. You answered each question well, including in ways that deflected some of the um, potential uh, pitfalls that the questions presented. So there was an artfulness in the way you presented your arguments and in responding to the questions that were thrown at you. That was really very um, unusual in lawyers even far more experienced certainly than any of you. So congratulations. Anytime you want to come argue in the Southern District of Texas, <laughs> Houston Division, you are more than welcome. <laughs> And I, likewise, will invite you to come to the Fourth Circuit after you pass the bar and you're duly admitted. You're not as picky. <laughs> I join in Judge Rosenthal's comments and compliments to you. Uh, Dean, I, I think you gave us uh, four ringers here, and you are just testing us. <laughs> It's almost like you had little earpieces over there and someone was telling you what to say on these questions. Uh, uh, this panel is, is incredible, uh, just in terms of their knowledge of the subject matter, but also in the questions that were directed to you, uh, and you handle them with a plum. You, uh, the kind of courtesy and the discussion uh, that you have with the court as opposed to arguing with the court or by presenting to the court. Uh, quite often we get litigants to come to us, uh, uh, lawyers who come to and their perspective is, well, I've got to make my point and judge you all to shut up and listen to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I never felt that in the process of it. Uh, you handled the questions as they flowed from judge to judge, uh, changed your perspective, acknowledged at points in which you perhaps weren't going to be that strong on that issue. I thought it was just incredible, uh, your, your presentation. And I think that uh, uh, all of you are uh, destined to be uh, particularly good litigators uh, out there in the real world. So thanks again for giving us this opportunity. Well, I hope I don't discredit my own court when I tell you that the quality of oral argument I heard today would be within the top 10 percent of the quality of the regular practice of oral arguments in my court. It was outstanding across the board. I like to um, analogize this oral argument to uh, a conversation, three-way conversation between the advocates, one each for each side, and the court as, as a body. And I thought this was just um, a, a classic demonstration of that today. There was um, excellent give and take, uh, responsiveness to the questions from the court, uh, concessions where concessions were appropriate, uh, follow-up, um, um, uh, solid defense of your, of your individual positions. And that's what uh, we, we, we hope to get, as well as the knowledge, the, the depth of knowledge which you demonstrated. We uh, look for that every day in, in our own uh, council, uh, but sadly to say, we don't always see it. In fact, we, in some cases, in certain 
classes of cases. I, I, I wish you would all specialize in immigration law, for example. <laughs> <laughs> that would, uh, in that case, you'd be in the top 1%. <laughs> because unfortunately our immigration bar uh, leaves um, something greatly to be desired in, in our court. But, um, I, so I just congratulate all of you. So I guess that's, that's the end of, of my individual comment. On behalf of the court, um, I would like to announce, it was a very, very close decision, but I would like to announce that we award the winning team to the petitioner side and the best oralist to Mr. Shine of the respondent side. So congratulations to you all. And if we could also uh, give a round of applause to an excellent panel. Uh, we have had a great time watching how well prepared you are and the conversation you've had with our competitors today. So a round of applause. And um, you're all invited to attend the reception that is out the back doors and to your right. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.